Real big welcome to all our visitors. It's good to, it's good to see you here. Amen. Amen. I hope you're blessed by the preaching of the Word of God. Luke chapter 7. I want to preach a message called Crossing Your Line. Crossing Your Line. And uh, so we're going to read a story here about this woman who you just heard sung about. And uh, Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. It says this, And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment, she stood at his feet behind him weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him. For she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. When they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore which of them will love him most. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no, gavest me no kiss. This woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meal with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said, uh, said to the woman, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, may uh, the truths and the, uh, the things that you want us to learn come forth this morning out of the Scripture, Lord. Please speak to our hearts through the preaching of the Word of God. Father, we just need the Holy Spirit of God to, to teach us, to move us into a place we probably never have been before, uh, all because of the love that we have for you, Lord. So, Father, please speak to our hearts this morning. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Crossing your line. I think you all know what it means to, uh, to cross a line. Uh, you're either on one side or you're on the other. Or, or maybe to go somewhere or do something that you've, you've never done before. In a sense, you're crossing a line. You've never been in that position. You've never done that before. You've never said that before. You've crossed over a line. You remember Moses, when he came down from the mount, saw the children of Israel playing and and worshiping a golden calf, and he got a little upset at that, didn't he? And he took a sword and drew a line in the sand, in a sense, and said, who was on the Lord's side? There was a line drawn, and you either crossed that line or you stayed on that side of the line. Many of us obviously know what a speed limit sign is. Now, we may know what it is, but we don't heed the speed limit sign. We're all guilty, amen? Look, if it says 80 kilometers an hour, when you go 81, are you breaking the law? Yes, you are. At 80, you're just sliding in, right? You're, you're okay. But there's a line. Once you cross it, you broke the law. Something's changed. There's the law of Moses. If you take something, maybe you take a pencil from work, you take it home with you, and uh, you come in the next day, and, and the boss says, uh, that pencil, I saw you take that out of the office yesterday, and you took it home, and you have brought it back, but uh, you do know that uh, that pencil belongs to us. Oh, I didn't mean to take it. That's actually taking something that isn't yours, isn't it? And what's that called? Wow. Just taking a pencil from work is called stealing. You see, the law shows us what sinners we are. We cross the line. We've crossed God's line. I'm trying to get you to see that there's lines that we've set up in our life, and we, we stop right there. And I want you to see that this woman just crossed the line. And it was her unbridled love for Jesus Christ. Every time I read this, 
about this woman. She humbles me. I think I want to be like that. That's how I want my Christian life to be. No lines, no barriers, no hindrances to serving the Lord. I want to have that unbridled love so that people will call me a line crosser. Nothing stops him from serving God. Her singular focus was on Jesus Christ. Didn't matter who was in the room. Didn't matter what they said about her. Total devotion to honoring the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm hoping to draw some help for all of us from this woman. Nothing, nothing that we wouldn't do for Jesus. There's nothing in our heart that says, oh, that's a line I've drawn in the sand. I'm not going to cross that line. I hope we can say I have no lines in my life. I love him so much, I'm going to do whatever he asks me to do. Now, she does some things that challenge us in our walk with God. I mean, can you see yourself there? Can you see yourself doing what this woman did? We would feel so out of place walking in. Now, obviously, Jesus isn't here. But I mean, going and doing something that would bring attention to ourselves in a way that we just don't want. She exhibits a love for Jesus Christ that we may never have experienced. We've never crossed that line to do something for Christ just because I love Him. I'm going to call it our love line. (laughs) Amen? Our love line. We come up to it and we stop. And then self-will takes over. Pride takes over. Our own attitude about what I should do and what I don't have to do. That takes over and becomes our focus. And we just are not going any farther. I'm drawing a line. That's how far I serve God. This woman didn't have any lines, as far as I could see. She did whatever she felt would honor Jesus Christ. She certainly exhibits for us the the memory verse for this month about perfect love. I mean, if anybody would have fear to walk into a house with a bunch of Pharisees, and she knew she was a sinner, the problem was the Pharisee didn't see himself that way. She knew she was a sinner, and she knew she had been forgiven for much. That's why she loved much. But she exhibits that perfect love that has no fear. It's a love that just breaks through barriers and walks over lines that others may have drawn that I'm not going to do that. I don't love Jesus that much. Ask yourself, do I want to show that perfect love? Do I want that? An unbridled love that commends... It's a love that's seen. Something that someone can see in your life. Now, the story, the story is probably have taken place in the town of Capernaum, okay? And Jesus is up in Galilee and he's ministering up there because there's many other stories about people who were, uh, women who anointed Jesus Christ, but they happened in different areas. This one here, I believe, happened in Capernaum, up in Galilee. And a Pharisee invites Jesus to his house for a meal. Jesus accepts, and they all sit down for a meal, right? Now, there's a woman. Now, again, I'm not sure who this woman was. I don't know her name, but it's not Mary of Bethany. I don't believe it's the one that anointed him for his burial and poured the ointment of spike nard over his head. This woman is crying at the feet of Jesus. As they're eating, she comes up to the feet of Jesus and weeps over him and then wipes his feet with her hair. So we don't know really who this woman is. But she's a woman in the city. She knows that Jesus is dining there at the Pharisee's house, and she makes her way over there. The woman reveals an alabaster box that she has of ointment, very precious, and she's going to anoint Jesus with it. But she comes weeping at the feet of Jesus, and she wipes those tears with her hair. Just totally unrestrained love for her master. She then pours the ointment on his feet and imagine the odor filling the room. Filling the room, this beautiful, precious ointment. She pours it out. Unbridled love doesn't count the cost. It didn't matter how much the ointment cost. What matters was that she was honoring her Savior, Jesus Christ. And she would have went to any cost to do that. Unbridled love counts the cost. You know, there was... Two women who went to a jewelry shop one day. I'm going to call them Kathy and Amanda. 
That way, that way it really comes home to you. Kathy and Amanda, I'm going to need water for this. <laughs> Kathy and Amanda go to the jewelry shop. Dan's home doing all the work. Or somewhere else. <laughs> anyway, Kathy and Amanda go to the jewelry shop, and Kathy sees this beautiful bracelet or some necklace, I've, and she just loves it. So she gets on her mobile phone that doesn't work very well, and she calls Dan at home. Dan's busy up on the ladder. <laughs> he comes down, answers the phone, and uh, Kathy says, uh, oh, I saw this beautiful bracelet in the store, and uh, I, I just it's just gorgeous. It, it's really not that much. And uh, Dan says, well, how much is it? And, and Kathy says, oh, it's this much. And he says, um, no, price too high. No, price too high. And she says, what, what? No, price too high. And then the phone cuts out. Well, Amanda, right away, leans over and says, what did he say? What did he say? He said, Dan said, no price too high. <laughs> she heard it a little bit differently than it was said. But you know what? This woman, to her, no price was too high. There was no cost that she wouldn't pay to honor Jesus Christ. I want to ask you, is there any price too high to pay for Jesus Christ? Think of just who it is that you serve. And I serve. You are not willing to pay the price? Turn with me to 2 Samuel 24. 2 Samuel chapter 24. Second Samuel 24. We're going to pick the story up in verse 18. David has been moved by Satan to number the people of Israel, number the, the army and his, his standing army. At the, uh, even Joab knew that he shouldn't have done that, but he was prideful. And he, he sends them out. He numbers the, numbers the army, numbers the people. And God is upset at that because of David's pride. He gives David a, in fact, if you look in verse 13, he gives David a choice. Gad, the seer or prophet at that time, so Gad came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in the land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Or uh, that there be three days pestilence in the land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. So David is going to be, uh, David and the people of Israel are going to suffer under one of those conditions. Well, David kind of throws himself into the lap of the Lord and says, in verse 17, And David spake unto the Lord when he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned, and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. So David is now, he sees that he sinned, he's contrite. And then verse 18, And God came that day to David, and said unto him, Go up and rear an altar unto the Lord in the threshing floor of Aruna, the Jebusite. David, according to the saying of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. And Aruna looked and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Aruna went out and bowed himself before the king on his face upon the ground. And Aruna said, there, Wherefore is my lord the king come to his servant? And David said, To buy the threshing floor of thee, to build an altar unto the Lord, that the plague may be stayed from the people. So you see, that's what he chose. The plague is what's upon the people. And Arona said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seemeth good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing instruments and other instruments of the oxen for wood. All these things that Arona, as a king, give unto the king. And Arona said unto the king, Thy lord, thy God, accept thee. And the king, David, said unto Aruna, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which cost me nothing. So David brought the fleshing, threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. And David built there an altar unto the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. Why? Because David finally realized 
He had sinned against God, and he had a contrite heart. And when he went to offer to the Lord, he said, I have to pay. I have to, I have to pay for the, for the altar and, and, the, and the sacrifices and all the, thresh, all the things that I need to sacrifice because you, don't, you can't worship God without it costing you something. You're not going to give this to me and I want to worship God and it doesn't cost me anything. For us to truly worship God, it should cost us something. And maybe some of us this morning just need to remember what pit we've been pulled out of by God and how much he's been forgiven, he's forgiven us for and have a contrite heart about what we were and maybe even what we are right now so that we can truly worship God the way we should and that there's no price too high. David believed his, his desire to sacrifice God must cost him something. And it's going to cost us something to really honor God and cross lines that we've laid down in our life and we just said, we're not going to worship God. I'm not going to do that. That's because you're not willing to pay the cost. You're not willing to follow Him. You know, back in Luke chapter 7, the Pharisee in verse 39 is critical. You see what he says? If this man were a prophet, he'd have known who was touching him. As if she was a leper of some kind. As if, as if something was going to come off on him. This sinner. He's critical. He's prideful. Do you know why? You know why he would never cross that line? Because he wanted the honor. It was all a social thing for that Pharisee. I'm going to bring Jesus over and all my Pharisee friends will see. I'm going to bring him there for me. For my honor. How in the world could you possibly give honor to someone else when you're the one looking for the honor? That's the Pharisee. He's looking for the praise. It's all about me. Isn't that why Saul got upset at David? David's just obeying Saul, doing what he's supposed to do, going out and, and whipping up on the, all the different armies and, and doing his thing, and he'd come back and people would honor him. Saul hated that. I should get the honor. Saul wanted the pat on the back. In 3 John, there's a man named Diotrephes. He wouldn't even want people to come to the church. He wouldn't want them to get the honor. Well, let me tell you something. In this church and in every other church that where there's born-again believers, Jesus Christ gets the honor. Amen. He gets the preeminence in the church. Not even the pastor has to bow and say, He's the king. He's the one at the top. He gets the honor and glory. No one will take Jesus' glory. No one. But this Pharisee saw that woman just as a sinner, and Jesus allowed her to touch him. The Pharisee doesn't see himself the way the woman sees herself. Now, who would you rather be, the Pharisee or the woman? And by the way, some people that go over the line and do things that you would never do, we attack them and we talk about them. That's a shame. But you know what? When you get attacked and believe it, it's going to happen. As a young Christian, sometimes you'll see a young Christian and they just have all this zeal. And you're like, calm down, son. You know, don't let Jesus get you too upset. I mean, just chill out. And they're just got, they have zeal. Encourage them. Maybe your fire went out. Maybe you just have a few coals that are simmering. And his fire is burning. You ought to get a little closer to him or her and say, I want some of that fire back in my life. I want, to honor with, I want to honor Jesus the same way that person is doing. And they don't care who's watching. And can I tell the person that's got zeal for the Lord, don't attack back if you feel any criticism. Just lift up Jesus Christ. You know, in verses 40 through 43, Jesus sees the hearts of two sinners. And he tells that parable about the creditor that had two debtors, one 500 pence, one 50. But Jesus does a... He looks into the heart, doesn't he, Pat? He looks right at your heart. The outside doesn't mean a whole lot to Jesus. He looks at the heart like he did with Nicodemus. He does an MRI. You know, he does an x-ray, ultrasound, and he checks it out. And he looks right in there. That's what Jesus can do. You know, when they did a, a, a they put that catheterization on me and my groin and then went up and looked at my heart. Uh, I was a little drowsy from all the medication. And I was kind of laying there, but I did hear one thing. I heard the doctor say, everything looks clean in here. Everything looks clear. I don't see anything. I was like, <laughs> I mean, even on the table, I was giving a thumbs up. 
But you know what? If he'd have looked in there and says, what about your love for Jesus? I'd hope he'd have found it so clogged. You know, like you don't want all that, you don't want all that, um, what's that stuff, plaque in your, in your arteries so your blood flows through. But I hope he would have seen a whole lot of love if Jesus looks in. I was glad it was all clean and green as far as my heart was concerned. But when Jesus looks in, I hope he finds a lot of love in there for him. So there's this parable of the creditor. And uh, you know what's the funny thing is? doesn't matter if, if you feel like you're a, a 50 euro sinner or a 500 euro sinner. Jesus has forgiven both of them. But it's your attitude about what you've been forgiven from that makes the difference. You both got the full pardon. You both got a clean slate. And both of us would have went to hell without it. So the question asked by Jesus uh, is, which of them will love him most? Basically, he's saying, who do you think is going to be more thankful and grateful for what I've done for him? The Pharisee said, well, I guess the one that you forgave the most. He said, thou hast rightly judged. And then he goes and tells them what selfless love does. What a grateful heart can do. It crosses lines that others have drawn in their lives. In verses 44 through 46, because it has a different master. The Pharisee's master was himself. The, the, girl, the woman's master was Jesus Christ. So, I guess I'm getting way behind here. I'm all the way up to there. And uh, what selfless love does, it crosses lines that others have already drawn in their lives. The Pharisee offered no water for Christ to clean his feet. But the woman wiped them with his tears. Why? She was grateful. She just wanted to say thank you. Over and over again, thank you, thank you to Jesus. The Pharisee offered no kiss of greeting, no loving welcome, but the, the woman kissed his feet. Why? Because she was in the presence of Jesus Christ. She was humbled by our Lord. The Pharisee saw this like a social honor for himself, but the woman honored Jesus. Why? Because he was the Lord. And by the way, he is your Lord. You don't make him Lord. When you do, at least you'll realize what he already is. He is the Lord. He's their Lord. Every unsaved one, he's still their Lord. He's the Lord. You know, the common practice of anointing the guest head with oil wasn't observed. In, in Psalm 23, 5, it says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. That's something you did when someone came to your house in those days. You would take oil and put it on their head. Whether it was for the fact that the sun had been beaten down on their head all day, or just to honor them by putting a little oil on their hair. That honored them. He didn't do that, but the woman came over and anointed him with the most precious ointment she had and poured it all over his feet. Is there anything too good for Jesus? Is there anything that you, can't, that you could do that would be just way above what, would, uh, what he deserved? I don't think so. This is, this is where self-glory hinders worship. When we're looking for the glory, we start to measure out what we will do. I'm only going to do that much. I'm only going to do that much. But when you want to glorify him, you'll do anything. When you're, when you're just falling in love with Jesus, when you're loving him, you'll just do whatever he wants you to do. You won't stop short. It won't be all measured out. Verses 47 through 50, Jesus finally gives the explanation for the woman's actions. She loved much because she was forgiven much. This woman's love for Jesus was not the cause of the remission of her sins, but the recognition of the remission of her sins because she was given a full pardon. The forgiveness that she received was the cause of her great love. Forgiveness is the cause. A deep, thankful, and unbridled love is the effect of that. So you have to think, how much was I forgiven for? It's faith that saves. You see that in verse 50. Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. It's faith that saves us. And it's just the result of a thankful heart. Jesus pronounced that this woman's Sins are forgiven, and the reason is clear. Jesus knew that she needed forgiveness. And so does everyone in here. Daily we sin, 
And we need to go to God. And if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I wonder if there's one in here that's never had full remission of sins. They've never been pardoned for all their sins. Oh, you've only broken one of the Ten Commandments that you can think of. My friend, if you've broken one, you've broken them all. And that's only ten of the commandments. There were 613 to deal with for the Jew. The law can't fix you. It only reveals what we are. It didn't bring, it didn't bring the sin into your life, and it can't fix it. It's just a mirror. It says, here's what you are. The only thing that fixes us is grace. The fact that Jesus would die on a cross for us, sinners, that's what fixes us. But the law shows you that every single person in here needs to be saved. If you're not, you need to be. Because you're going to a devil's hell just as sure as you're sitting on one of these nice chairs. You're going there if you're not saved. I don't know. Some of us may see it differently. But I see heaven and I see hell. There's no in-between. You won't find purgatory in the Bible. You're not going to be able to pray yourself out after 10,000 years or somebody else. It's over. Once you die, the soul finds its place up there or down there in the center of the earth. Jesus says to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Do you have peace with God this morning? Do you know for sure what's going to happen when you die? Let me give you some thoughts. Your salvation experience will definitely show itself in your walk and in your love for Jesus Christ. Always remember just what Jesus Christ has done for you. And I'm looking around, and I know we all come from different backgrounds. And when I think of my testimony, when I think of where Jesus Christ took me from, I just want to say thank you. Right now. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. And you want to do the same thing. Some of you didn't sin the way I sinned. You're a 50-euro sinner. <laughs> Guess what? You would have went to hell for 50 euros. And just like I would have went to hell for my 500-euro sin. You needed to be saved the same way I did. It's our thankfulness. You can thank them, or you can say, I'm not thanking them. Doesn't, it won't mean anything to me. I want to say thank you with my life. I want to tell them I love you with my life. You can do it or you don't have to. No one's forcing you. See where you've drawn lines already in your, in your Christian life. Borders you're not going to cross whether it be in your service or your worship of Jesus Christ. Some have just never once, never once talked to anybody about Jesus Christ. I couldn't point you out. I don't know. But I would think that there's one and maybe more that have never talked to somebody else about Jesus. Never given them a track. Never just shared their testimony and said, here's what Jesus did for me. Because they were afraid of what somebody might say what they might think of them, as if it was, we should be ashamed to be Christians. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I can tell you a lot of things I am ashamed of. I'm ashamed of what I used to be, but I'm not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I'm not ashamed of his Bible. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of other Christians. And I'm not ashamed to show my love for Jesus. I wish I could do more of it. I have enough things to be ashamed of. I'm challenging you today to see where your lines are drawn in your life. The lines that you've drawn. Are you more the Pharisee in your love or the woman? Just how much do you love Jesus? Just how thankful and grateful are you for the great debt that has been forgiven you? It's paid in full, by the way. The sins that you're going to commit this afternoon, they're already paid for. The sins that you're going to commit tomorrow, they're already paid for. We don't sin like we used to, praise God, but we still sin. How far will you go in serving and worshiping the Lord or not go? See, it, all, it, that, it will match exactly to your love for Him. How far you'll go, or, oh, that's it, that's as far as I go. Then that's how much you love Jesus. Has nothing to do with ability. Has everything to do with, am I willing to do what Jesus wants me to do? Am I going to go all the way because I love Him? Are you a 
You see yourself as the 500 uh, pence debtor because that's what the woman was. Now, why have you drawn lines? Why are those lines there? Let me tell you the first one is a lack of love. Let's look at some scripture. Mark chapter 5. Get you to turn and wake you up here before you fall asleep on me. Mark chapter 5. The lack of love or thankfulness. Mark chapter 5 and in verse 1. And they came over unto the other side of the sea, unto the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, Jesus, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. Because that he had been often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had been plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces, neither could any man tame him. And always night and day he was in the mountains and in the tombs, crying and cutting himself with stones. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him. Let me just say this. When you read this, don't you feel like crying for this man? Don't you feel so bad for him? How could anybody be in that much torment? I feel so bad for this guy. I'm so glad that he met Jesus. Verse 15 says, you know, with Jesus casts out all the demons in him. And in verse 15, and they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion sitting and clothed in his right mind. And they were afraid. I'll tell you who wasn't. That Gadarene demoniac wasn't. He wasn't scared anymore. There was no fear in him. Verse 18, and when they was come into the ship, he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. Howbeit Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed, and he went and hid himself in a cave again. And he began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Why? He was so thankful that he wasn't in a cave by himself anymore sitting there naked and bound with a chain that he'd been pulling at until he could break it and cutting himself with stones and crying how ashamed he was of himself, tormented by these demons. You know what happened? He got changed. And if you've been saved here today, you, know what you, you should know what you've been changed from and from where you were on your way to. And that should promote a thankfulness and a love. Some of us have forgotten what Jesus has done for us. We've forgotten the sin that's been, that's been uh, canceled, the debt's been canceled, the torment that we might have been in as a, as a lost sinner, the death that awaited us and the hell that's there right now that we would have went to. We've forgotten it for some reason. This man didn't. You know why? Because in verse 19, Jesus had compassion on him. Jesus had compassion on him. And he had compassion on you and I. And we ought to say thank you, thank you, thank you, over and over again with our lives. Turn to Luke chapter 15. One book to your right, Luke chapter 15. I don't think there's anybody in here that doesn't find two words most powerful, and that is thank you. When someone says thank you, it's like, that's enough. I mean, no matter what you do for them, they say thank you. Thank you so much. It's like, yeah, that's appreciation for what someone's done for you. Thank you goes a long way, but many of us are unthankful. We haven't said thank you to Jesus in a long time. In Luke chapter 15 and verse, I'm sorry, it's 17. It's Luke 17. Why did you guys let me go to 15 when it was right up there 17? (laughs) Maybe (laughs) I got the same Bible you got, amen? All right, Luke chapter 17, it's verse 15. And uh, you know about these lepers, all 10 of them got healed, right? In verse 15, and one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face, uh, face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan, and Jesus answering said, Where are there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? They are not found that return to give glory to God, save this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. He was already healed. Now something else changed in his life. 
He was, I believe he got saved. But those other ones were healed, but they didn't say thank you. There was no thank you. They just went on their way. They cried out the blues when they wanted to, when they wanted to get healed. And I would have too if I was a leper and saw Jesus who could heal. But when you get healed of leprosy, don't you think it's right to go back and say thank you? Guess what? Every sinner in here was a leper. Because leprosy is a picture of sin. And God healed us. Let's say thank you. Let's be thankful for what he's done. How do you see yourself as the 50 or the 500 debtor to Christ? Because it makes all the difference in your service and worship to Jesus. We were all like that wild man back there in, in, in Gadarenes. We were all like him before we got saved. And every once in a while, that old nature roars. In fact, that old nature in you is the one that's setting the lines in your life. That's the one that's putting the barriers up to your worship. You're not walking in the spirit. You're walking in the flesh. And the old nature says, stop right there. I am not going out soul winning on Saturday. I don't do that. We'll stay home and do what we want to do. That's the flesh talking. The spirit says, come out and share your faith with someone. And we're not going to do it. We're rebellious sinners, and Jesus has changed us, and we ought to be thankful. The problem with some of us is that the old nature is still calling the shots and setting the lines and barriers in our life. You know what that's called? Selfishness. All of us experienced it at one time or another. How about self sitting on the throne? Luke chapter 9. We're already in Luke. Luke chapter 9. And in verse 23. What do we do with self? What do we do with our ambition? What do we do with our ways and our ideas and what we consider to be the, the right way to go? And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall, shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. What, for what is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? You know, what is your goal? You want to take control of your own life? Save your own life? Or will you just lose it and give control to Jesus Christ? You know, if you're following after Jesus, if you're following after somebody, you're going to have to keep your eyes on them. Because wherever they go, you're supposed to go. So your focus should always be on Jesus Christ. He makes a left turn, you, you follow Him. Wherever Jesus is going, because I'm coming after Him. Wherever His footsteps lead, that's where I'm going. Until self says, you follow me. I'm in charge of my life. I have power over my life. You do. You do. You can. But it's not going to be what Jesus Christ wants for you. It's not going to be His will. You're putting conditions now on following the Lord Jesus Christ. You've just now set a line. What is your goal in life? What has captured your attention? What are you pursuing after? And whatever you're pursuing, does it have any eternal benefits to it? If it's not for Jesus, if it's not what he wants you to do. Some are looking for a job. Some have found a job. I would think that that's something Jesus wants for them to have, a job. It's not wrong to pursue the things that you know are good for you, to be a better Christian. I mean, you work and you do your, you do your work and then God affords you food and clothes and housing and praise God. That's what he wants for your life. But he also wants you to share your faith. He also wants you to be here Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday evening. He also wants you to be a part of everything going on in the church and help each other and, and, and help the body of Christ. But some of us are doing our own thing. And by the way, this church is different than other churches. This church loves each other. So although I feel like at times I'm preaching to the choir, we're still sinners, aren't we? We each have a ways to go. But let me tell you, this church is different than other churches. When you have such a high percentage of the body of Christ serving in ministries like this, that does not happen in all churches. And churches of 100 or 300 or 1,000 can sometimes have such low percentages going out, soul winning. This church blows those away in the percentage of people among the 100 or so that actually go out soul winning. You won't find that in all churches. There'll just be a few. Maybe a pastor and a few deacons. Maybe. It's hard to get people out soul winning. 
This church does a great job at that, but we can do better because we've set some lines. Are we not pay, willing to pay the real cost of discipleship? Follow Jesus? Why is discipleship so unappealing today to the church, to Christians? Because we have a worldly view. It's all about me. We've become caught up in all the, the social media and all that's going on in the world. We've been caught up in that. And we've gotten our eyes off of Jesus Christ. And to follow him is so unappealing. What are you doing? Why do you do that? Because I'm a Christian. But there's so many other things to do and to have fun at. Well, there may be, but they're all going to burn up. <laughs> Hopefully, a couple things that I'm doing for Jesus are going to last forever. There's a cost to following Jesus, and this is the reason. Death to self. That's what taking up your cross daily and following him is. I have to say, death to myself. Death to my ambitions and ideas and my goals. Let me see what Jesus wants for my life. I guarantee you some of them might even line up. But put him first. Self sits on the throne of your life. That could be one of the lines that is drawn. Sin is in control. Proverbs 28, verse 1. We're almost done here, so come on. Turn over to Proverbs 28, and in verse 1. Sin is in control. There's the line of lack of love or thankfulness. There's the line that self is drawn because it's sitting on the throne of your heart. There's the line that sin is in control of your life. Proverbs 28 verse 1 says, The wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. You know why you can't do anything for God? Because you're afraid to. You're afraid to go soul winning. You're afraid to work in a crash. You're afraid to work in a Sunday school. You're afraid to help with the Bible club. You're afraid, you're afraid, you don't want to do it. Because sin, you're a sinner. Not only one like we all are, but there's something hidden in your heart that is unconfessed. And you won't get right with God. And the wicked flee when no man pursueth, but the righteous are bold as a lion. When you're right with God, there's nothing you can't do for God when you're right with God. But if you're against God, if your sins have separated you from Him, now you're fearful. You don't want to, you don't want to be around other Christians. You, you have unconfessed sin. It's paralyzed you. It's like put you back into bondage. Your fear from some secret sin. Look at Acts chapter 4. You're missing this ingredient. Acts chapter 4. And in verse 13. By the way, well, Acts chapter 4, verse 12 uh, precedes that. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. What a difference. Ignorant men like us, and uh, unlearned men like us, People will marvel at us because of the things that we might attempt for Jesus Christ and do for the Lord, ladies included. We do it. Why? Because we've been with Jesus. And we have a boldness that just takes us wherever we need to go for the Lord's sake. But if you have sin in your life, you're fearful. I'm not going to do that. It's paralyzed you. The only other thing is that you're not born again. The reason you're not serving God is because you don't know God. Well, you think you know Him, and you may know about Him up here, but you don't know Him down here. That only happens by knowing His Son, Jesus Christ. There's only one other possibility. You've never been completely forgiven like this woman was. You don't have peace with God. You're not assured of heaven. Turn to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, and in verse 6. Romans chapter 5, and in verse 6. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, 
Christ died for us. Jesus didn't die for good people. Jesus crossed a line that nobody's ever crossed. I mean, I'm just trying to preach to you about a woman who crossed lines that we've never even, that we've already drawn in our lives, that we've never crossed, but she was doing it for Jesus. He's a good object of our love. But who was the object of Jesus' love? Us. Sinners. Vile, wicked sinners. You talk about somebody setting the example that had no lines in his life. He went all the way to the cross and died on a cross, not for good people. Some would even dare to do good for a good person and even die for a good person. But Jesus died for sinners. He showed us what lines uh, are drawn. He had no lines in his life. He didn't die for good people. He died for sinners. Can we not cross a line for him? If he'll do what he did for us, can we not cross some lines in our life for him who did so much for us? Are you catching what I'm saying? Jesus is the Savior of the world. There is none else. Acts 4.12, I just read that. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. I don't know where you are today, but if you're here and you're not saved, there is nowhere else to look. You can't look to the priest. You can't look to the pastor. You can't look to the rosary. You can't look to Mary. You can't look to baptism. You can't look to good works. You can't look to Buddha. You can't look to Muhammad. There's only one place that you can get salvation. It's in Jesus Christ. And don't ever be ashamed to tell people that with love in your heart. That only Jesus Christ, he's the standard. So, that's a long title there. So where is your line that you will not cross in your worship and service for Jesus Christ? Where is it? Because you know there's some things that you will not do. Even now you're thinking, I've never done that. I've always shrinked away from doing that. Is your line closer to the Pharisee or the woman? Because that'll tell you how much you feel like you've been forgiven for. What will you do in service to God? What fear has gripped your heart? Or do you just don't care? You're apathetic. I don't care. I mean, I'm preaching to you right now. God's speaking to your heart, and you're just saying, no. That's between you and the Lord. Where will you not go? Who will you not speak to about Jesus Christ? Because you just fear what someone else might say. The fear of man bringeth a snare. Where are the lines drawn in your life as a Christian? I want you to consider that this morning. Now for the invitation. Maybe you're here this morning without Jesus as your Savior. You're trusting in other things. All I can tell you is there's only one way to heaven. That's it. I can preach it. I'm just a messenger. It's right here in this book. People trust in so many other things, but what God has actually said. We're out soul winning yesterday. And a couple of the girls that Gavin was talking to. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. They didn't know whether they were going to heaven or hell. They didn't know about Jesus. Or they didn't know about God. I don't know. It's totally ignorant. So you don't have to go far to find somebody to witness to. <laughs> You're not going to knock on a wrong door. I wish somebody would knock on my door and say, hi, I'm a born-again Christian. I would... I would like to leave this track with you, invite you to our church. Nobody's ever done that. There's only one person that came to my door. That was the one that wanted to see me get saved 26 years ago. Have you ever had your door knocked on by a Christian? <laughs> no. Jehovah's Witness, maybe. But not a Christian. We've got to do a better job of telling people how to be saved. And brethren, let's learn from this woman that unbridled love for Jesus Christ crosses any line. At least it won't be self on the throne. Jesus will be on the throne. And yes, you go into it with fear and trembling. If anybody thinks I'm comfortable up here preaching, you got another thing coming. Every time I come up here, it's with fear and trembling, Leo. And if anything good happens, give God the glory because I don't want His glory. 
I'm just so thankful that he would even use a vessel like me. I know what I was, and I know who I am. And any other person that comes up here and preaches or stands at the Sunday school and tries to teach those kids, you realize how little you are, <laughs> how much you need them. Just give Jesus Christ his rightful place in your life and in your heart and follow him. Why? Because you love him. No more lines. I just love Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Your heads bowed and your eyes closed. Again, I, I don't like to see anybody go away empty. There's someone here this morning. You're not sure you're saved. I'm not asking you to do anything, really. I'm just asking you to consider the fact that you don't have to leave here lost. There is no reason to walk out of here lost. You could just find somebody that you know is a Christian and ask them to share the Bible verses with you about being saved. You simply have to believe that you're going to have to see yourself as lost before you ever consider needing a Savior. And Christian, I don't know what it is in your life. One of those couple things there, whether it's sin or just self is sitting on the throne, or you're just ungrateful and unthankful for what God's done for you. I don't know what that is. But you've got some lines drawn in your life and you're not willing to cross them. You need to restore your relationship with Jesus Christ. You need to love Him like you never have before. Heavenly Father, I just pray that, uh, especially if there's one that's not saved here today, I pray that they might find someone and talk to them, Lord. Lord, I, I never get tired of Never get tired of sharing my, my faith and how to be saved, the gospel with somebody. Never get tired of it. So I pray, Father, that they'd realize they don't have to leave here lost. They don't have to leave shameful, full of guilt about what they are, what they've done. They can be completely cleansed today. I pray, Father, that there might be one here today that might get saved. Father, I'm thankful for the guests that have come. I pray, Father, uh, that they know that they're saved, that they know they're on their way to heaven. If not, why leave? Why leave today? Why not find somebody and, and ask how to be saved? How can I be saved? And Christian, I just pray, Father, that you just open their hearts, pour your love in. And Father, if they're going to turn away, that's between them and you. But God, that you would pour your love in and show them what you've done for them. And that we would cross some lines in our life. That we'd realize and look back to the pit that we came out of and be thankful and put you back on your rightful spot in our heart, that you would sit on the throne of our life. God, please, be in charge. And Lord, help us to cross lines like this woman did. We're still talking about her today, 2,000 years later. She's in the canon of Scripture. She is in Scripture for a reason, because I knew there'd be a day when we thought ourselves the 50 pence sinner and not the 500. So God, help us to remember what you've done for us. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.